Well, good evening to Monday, February 14th, Valentine's Day, as we are in Lesson 19, studying Matthew chapter 18. I'd like to welcome all our area groups here in the greater Richmond area, all the satellite groups and those who um, are joining us uh, virtually. You know, it's interesting, the polarization of views about politics, science, economics, culture, core beliefs, values, and a host of other things <clears throat> seem to dominate the culture globally. Fear and division are significant things playing out in our homes, hearts, 24 seven every day. And this has led to a significant breakdown in civil discussion, relationships, communities, our churches and friendships. Love, care, compassion has been replaced with bitterness, anger, and an unwillingness to listen and understand opposing viewpoints. The result is judgmentalism, a lack of humility, and a willingness to, and a lack of willingness to offer forgiveness, mercy, and grace to the people in our lives. Polarization division leads you and me to ask a question like, if everyone was more like us, right, you or me, or my thought group, there would be less problems in the world. And hopefully we can all see that there's clearly a problem with that, the standard. The other person or group feels exactly the same way. So we both have the wrong standard. Worst of, all, worst of all, polarization hinders or blocks out the voice of God and the work of the Holy Spirit who is in us and whose voice is the only voice we should be focused on. And it often gets drowned out by all the noise and distractions in our lives. Well, God calls his children, you and me, to follow him, to follow his principles, not our preferences. He is the standard. He calls you and me to grow and mature in personal holiness in our relationship with him, and importantly, into Christ likeness. The process of growing mature in our relationship with Jesus is called sanctification. And we grow in holiness so that we look like and reflect Jesus to the world around us. And they all desperately need them. Many of us have experienced this process and would agree that it is generally quite painful as the Holy Spirit pulls out the roots of our old selves. But thankfully, it is also productive as we turn from our sinfulness toward listening and obeying God. The outward or observable result is our hearts are filled with gratitude, compassion, humility, and forgiveness. We are then modeling Christ in thought, word, and action, and our relationship with God deepens, and our relationship with others improve. One pastor and theologian said that the first four verses of Matthew 18 set the stage for the rest of the chapter. Jesus uses an analogy to illustrate what, what it means to be a Christian. The rest of the chapter then unpacks how we, as Christians, should relate to each other in the church. Jesus is clearly concerned that his followers be marked by humility, love, and a willingness to lavishly forgive one another. <clears throat> in our passage this week, we see an attitude of pride, the desire for fame and honor, that competitive doggy dog mentality that many of us are familiar with. And as followers of Jesus, we're not immune from this thinking or behavior. We can easily drift into allowing pride to get in the way of grace. Importantly, pride prevents you and me from revealing God's heart to those around us. Matthew chapter 18 is timely and critically important, like a mirror. It reveals that when our hearts are full of ourselves, God can't fill our hearts with his character. We dismiss and ignore the Holy Spirit. Jesus reveals the hearts of those men, and he reveals his Father's heart, which is diametrically opposed to the values of this world. Jesus calls you and me and every person who calls themselves a follower to humbly reflect his heart by caring for and forgiving others. And that's our first, um, excuse me, that's our big idea this evening. Christ likeness equals a loving, humble heart that forgives and seeks restoration of relationships. Christ likeness equals a loving and humble heart that forgives and seeks restoration of relationships. And we've broken this lesson down into two divisions. Uh, first division in the first 20 verses, Jesus answers disciples' questions about being the greatest. And in verses 21 to 35, Jesus teaches about the importance of forgiveness. So let's begin with prayer. 
Heavenly Father, your heart is always turned towards your children. Thank you. You protect your people from harm and from false idols that would draw us away from you. So tonight, Lord, show me where I am allowing needless temptations into my life. Forgive me when I cause others to stumble by my example or foolishly excusing sin within myself. Father, I ask that you give me and each person listening tonight the courage to act on what is, whatever it is that you are saying to each of us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you would, please open your Bibles or Bible apps <clears throat> to Matthew chapter 18, where we see Matthew tells us, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, the disciples' question revealed their hearts and betrayed their thoughts that privilege entailed ruling and status rather than becoming servants. Many questions, unfortunately, are like that. Phrased simply, they hide attitudes that require an answer quite different from the one anticipated by the question itself. William, uh, William Shakespeare said, be not afraid of greatness. Some men are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. A theolo one theologian said that the disciples uh, were with true greatness in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was great as only God is great. They were not. They had not been born great. They had not achieved greatness. They had not had greatness thrust upon them. Yet they wanted so much to be great. Their question provided the opportunity for Jesus to teach about true greatness. And only as Jesus can, he uses a visual aid to illustrate a spiritual truth and reality by calling a little child to join the group. In verse two, Jesus says, truly I tell you, and when Jesus uses that phrase, we know that he is going to, he's about to say something that's really important and it would be best if we were listening and then actually doing what he says. He says, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. I mean, amid the discussion of greatness in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus called a child and put him in the middle of the disciples. Now, as we discussed in our leaders meeting on Friday morning, this would have set the disciples on their heels, as well as anybody that would have been listening had they been able to. I mean, children had no standing in that society. And once again, Jesus upends cultural thinking by saying, to be a citizen of heaven, you must become like children. And in so doing, you become a child of the true king. One of our leaders shared something we are all familiar with. Children respond to new people by holding tightly on to a parent, getting behind them while listening and looking intently. And I'm reminded of my own children wanting and needing to be held or fed or read to or loved or provided for. You remember how your children or grandchildren used to run up to you with open arms and smiles on their faces? Imagine the joy that you and I would bring to God if we humbled ourselves like that before him. Do you and I do this with our Heavenly Father? Probably not. So let's challenge ourselves to have that image in mind as we approach and interact God from a childlike posture. In this posture of humility and childlike awe and wonder, the Holy Spirit can work in us revealing sin, correcting us, and guiding us. He will use God's word, life circumstances, and other believers to convict us, to call us to repent and turn from our sinful behaviors and importantly, calls to something far greater. Have you and I turned from ourselves and trusted in Jesus as Lord over our lives? Have you, like a child, left behind all you were holding on to and have run to God the Father through Jesus as the only one whom you can trust with your life now and forever? If not, I invite you to please do that today. Turn from yourself and trust in the Father. This is the essence of what it means to be a true disciple, to be a child of the king. So what does childlike mean? Well, child, uh, children have many characteristics that we are not to copy. They lack experience and knowledge, generally struggle to concentrate for long periods of time. Children are prone to make poor decisions. So clearly, Jesus is not suggesting we be childish. He wants us to have childlike awe, openness, to have a teachable spirit. And, one, and something we know to be true, the smartest and the most intelligent, successful, or gifted person listening must come to Jesus with humility of heart, turning from themselves and trusting completely in him. 
no matter what you what age you and I might be, this is the essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, a child of God. Left to our sinful nature, we are all rebels, rebels who want to be in control, to be to be sadly uh, in charge. We rarely want to serve others. It's not fun to be a servant. Jesus is saying that his father's heart for us is to be humble servants, having the characteristics of an unspoiled child, trustful and dependent. To have a desire to make a difference in the lives of others, which requires us to empty ourselves of any desires to be greater than others. Do you and I demonstrate those characteristics? With the child as a visual aid, Jesus moves on in verse 5 through 10 to say that as his followers must not only accept little children for Jesus' sake, they must also receive all of God's children seeking to minister to them. Jesus tells us that it is a serious matter to cause a child of God to sin or to lead them astray or to cause them to stumble because of our actions, attitudes, or words. Did you happen to feel that poke? I know I did. When was the last time our behavior may have had a negative impact, impact on another believer, another child of God? Jesus is essentially saying, when you receive my children, you receive me. Treat my children harshly. You will wish you had cast yourself into the bottom of the sea with a stone fastened around your neck. That's pretty strong language. In these verses, we see the importance of receiving, reconcile, and restoring relationships with one another. We are not to subject one another, but, excuse me, not to reject one another, but rather protect one another from sin by selflessly showing concern for each other's holiness. Our hearts should break for the things that break God's heart, especially when it's someone that we love, a brother or sister in Christ, and especially when they are rebelling by remaining in sin. Everywhere we look, everywhere we go, we are bombarded with temptations from people, what we read, what we listen to or watch. So in light of this, you and I should be aware of our thoughts, actions, and attitudes so that we do not lead someone into sin or reject God. So how do we do this? In verses 8 through 9, Jesus uses strong figurative language to tell us that we must start by being radically committed to our own holiness. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. If something is leading you to sin, get rid of it. Don't toy with it. Don't flirt with it. Don't see how close to the edge you can get. Instead, walk away, destroy it. You see how Jesus is telling us that the two go together? When we are zealous about the holiness and of, of our own lives, then we will be zealous in protecting one another's, all the other one another's in our lives from sin. And we will be more aware of sin in our own lives and more careful not to sin so that our witness is not compromised. Jesus is pointing out the importance of self-examination, self-denial, and that takes humility. He is instructing us to invite and cooperate with the Holy Spirit who will perform the needed spiritual surgery in us, removing anything that causes us to stumble or that may cause others to stumble. Truly humble followers live for Christ first, others next. We put ourselves last by building others up, not tearing them down. A humble disciple should be a stepping stone, not a stumbling block. Would that be said of you and me? Do the things that break God's heart break ours? Jesus shows how we must love and care for others. In verses 10 through 14, he uses the parable about a lost sheep to show us his father's heart. Each of his children is precious. In the parable, a sheep is stumbling, wandering off, and in danger of being lost. Because each child of God is of infinite value to our father, and as followers, we have a responsibility to rescue, protect, and search for the lost. We seek reconciliation, restoration by caring for others, not by causing them to stumble or fall. And the more we study the Bible, there are many images that reveal the protecting care God offers his people. 
However, the best image is of sheep and shepherds. And so we immediately think of Psalm 23, where the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We recall John 10, where Jesus tells us that he is the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Psalm 100 tells us that we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And the prophet Isaiah wrote that God tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs into his arms and carries them close to his heart. And you recall a few weeks ago, we read that Jesus had compassion on the crowds because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. But what about when an offense is reversed, when you are the one sinned against? Well, we all know that the breakdown of relationship through sin is fraught with danger. It can lead to all sorts of fragmentation and bitter disputes if it is not dealt with carefully and biblically. So we, we tend to be goal-driven, and it's no different here. So the overall aim must clearly be defined, and Jesus does this for us in verse 15. For there are to be restoration and renewal, we must win our brother over brother or sister over. The stages described in these verses have all of that in the end view, end in view. Jesus says that the first step when I have been sinned against by a fellow Christian is not to tell a third party, but to take the initiative, to go to my brother or sister and talk to him or her and seek to get the situation rectified. This means that when someone comes to us and complains about someone else, we have to behave in the same way and refuse to discuss it until the parties have met and talked it over themselves. If we all did this, gossip would be stopped. And what confidence and relaxation would prevail in our churches if we knew that talking behind others' backs would not be tolerated? And that reminded me of something when I first got involved in politics, um, that how the phone call chains work. Where, uh, you know, I would call someone else, and excuse me, I didn't, but someone would call and they just, you know, say something about somebody else. And I quickly seized on that and I put three-way calling on my phone. This was back in the 90s. And if someone called me to talk about somebody else, I would say, hold on. And then I would put the other person on the phone. And then I'd say, now I have so-and-so. So what is it that we want to discuss? And that ended me getting those phone calls. So we just have to really not tolerate this idea of gossip or talking behind people's backs. But what if this initial approach fails? Well, Jesus follows the Old Testament pattern by seeking two or three witnesses to get involved. And if this semi-private approach also fails to solve the problem, then the matter is to be brought out into the open in church fellowship. But these aren't easy principles to adopt, are they? Well, why is that? Well, clearly it's because they cut across pride in our fears. We don't like to get into these kinds of discussions. But if we truly love our brother and care for him or her, we need to take Jesus' word seriously because loving, forgiving, and caring relationship are of paramount importance in the Father's heart. In some situations, however, despite the entire church offering a clear demonstration of grace, of the grace of God, a brother or sister may refuse to listen. And then what do we do? Well, Jesus gives us a command, not a suggestion. So not to follow, this would be a sin. And the command is to treat him or her like they are no longer a brother or sister and a member of the body of Christ. And they need to be expelled from the church until such time as that they turn from whatever the actions or uh, sinfulness that they've displayed has been resolved. But for the church to kick someone out is pretty tough. And it's really tough, even tougher to understand, isn't it? I mean, surely isn't the church a place where everyone is welcome? Though doesn't this seem to go against the grain of everything that we think? But in the New Testament, the New Testament church did that. Paul, writing the believers in Corinth, uh, reminds us that the ultimate goal in this process is always restoration, that your brother or sister will see his sin or her sin and return to Christ. This process is for their good, and it's for the protection and the purity of the church. And ultimately, it's for the glory of God and the body of Christ. Jesus knows church discipline is not easy and that we will be tempted to shy away from it. So in these verses, he encourages by saying, when you're in a difficult work of church discipline, in the difficult work of church discipline, when two or three of you are gathered with a brother or sister who is living in an unrepentant sin and you are doing the tough work of gentle, loving confrontation, be assured of this. My presence, which is always with you, will be especially real 
tangible and especially strong and needed in the middle of the situation. Be assured that you will experience my presence in a unique and powerful way. Now, that's confidence. And Jesus has given us his authority, granted us his support, and guaranteed his presence so that we might reflect his Father's heart in order to restore one another. And so this brings us to our first main truth tonight. Following God's heart means eliminating pride by humbly restoring and serving others with love. Following God's heart means eliminating pride by humbly restoring and serving others with love. <clears throat> One pastor and author said that true humility is not thinking lowly of yourself, but thinking accurately of yourself. When Paul writes in Philippians uh, 2 verse 3, consider others better than yourselves, he uses a verb that means to calculate. The word implies a conscious judgment resting on carefully weighed facts. To consider others better than yourself, then, is to say that you know your place. True humility is quick to applaud the success of others. Paul says, give, give each other more honor than you want for yourselves. And Jesus is our example. Content to be known as a carpenter, happy to be mistaken for the gardener, he served his followers by washing their feet. If Jesus is so willing to honor us, can we not do the same for others? Can we not regard others as more important than ourselves? So be quick to share the applause. That's what love does. Thankfully, God's will for each of us is that we progressively grow in humility, holiness, and conformity to the image of Christ in his heart. The process of sanctification or spiritual growth and maturity is initiated by the Holy Spirit, who works to pull all sin in our lives, put all sin in our lives to death, and to give us the power to obey God. However, you and I are responsible to cooperate. And so as we um, study and read scripture, uh, all of us know that there is, are experiences in the Bible that are speaking to us and our situation so personally that it seems that it's actually reading us. God's word is a mirror that exposes our needs and reveals our God. How has God's word cleansed your heart renewed your mind, and stimulated your spiritual growth. And as we know, God cares more about our sanctification than our ease or comfort in this life. God knows when, where, and how each of us need to be stretched in order to grow. He is a master at orchestrating our lives, and he will use everything in our lives, even your leadership, uh, to sanctify you. Are you cooperating with his work by listening and obeying what he is saying and asking of you? Who has God called to mind that he wants you to reconcile and restore a relationship with? Will you seek his heart and go to that person in humility and compassion? Forgiving others, particularly when dealing with repetitive sin, is, ch uh, is challenging without God's help. And so in verses 21 to 35, we see Jesus in our second division. We see Jesus reveals God's grace and how ridiculous it is for you and I to withhold forgiveness from those who sin against us. When you and I start living a life of humility, honesty, and forgiveness, seeking restored relationships, we must take some risk. How much risk or how far we must go? Well, in verse 21, Peter speaks for all of us when he says, Jesus, set the boundary or limits on forgiveness. How does he do that? He says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, the rabbis taught a limit of forgiving that was three times. So, Peter, seeking to be as generous and gracious as he could, suggests raising the limit to seven. However, in verse 22, Jesus raises the limit to be unlimited, saying, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. So the point Jesus is making is clear. Love keeps no record of wrongs, so don't even think about counting. Instead, just forgive. If you've forgiven your brother that many times, you would have Develop the habit of forgiving, which reveals that you are truly a, true, a child of God, a follower of Jesus. Jesus illustrates his teaching using a powerful parable of an unmerciful and unforgiving servant, beginning in verse 23, says, For this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. One man owed 10,000 talents, and for perspective, one source said that one talent was worth approximately 6,000 denarii, 
and a denarius was a day's wage for common working people. So 10,000 talents is 200,000 years of labor. In modern money, $3 billion, an unimaginable amount to owe someone. So this servant had no ability to repay the debt. So the master ordered him to be sold along with his wife, children, and all of his possessions. The, th th the servant threw himself to the ground before him, pleading, be patient with me and I will repay you everything. The text says the Lord had compassion on the slave and released him and forgave him that debt. Now, that's, a, that's quite amazing, a $3 billion debt forgiven. After this forgiving servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. And we read that the forgiven servant grabbed the other servant by the throat and started to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe me. In this case, his fellow, uh, his fellow servant threw himself down and begged, be patient with me and I will repay you. But the forgiven servant refused. Instead, he went out and threw him in prison until he repaid the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were very upset, understandably, and then went and told their Lord everything that had taken place. Then his Lord called the first servant and said to him, evil servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not have shown mercy on your fellow servant just as I showed it to you? And in his anger, the Lord turned him over to the prison guards to torture him until he repaid all that he owed. And so also my heavenly father will do to you if each of you does not forgive your brothers from your heart. Now, what an amazing picture of grace. God could not be more clear. In Christ, you and I have received God's amazing and extravagant mercy. From the beginning, God's heart has always been about giving life and love to his creation. He, see he seeks out those who are lost, alone, hurting, and in need. He's compassionate and desires to forgive and to restore. God the Father's heart is full of mercy. And since we've received the Father's extravagant mercy, what should our response be? In verses 28 to 30, we're given an object lesson with the forgiven servant's interaction with the fellow servant who owed him an insignificant amount of money. And as hard as it is to believe, the forgiven servant turns petty rather than gladly extending mercy, grace, and forgiveness, which he received and did not deserve. And he harshly mistreated that fellow servant. The forgiven servant now wants justice. And as we saw, the king gives him justice, throwing him in prison. And the truth is, in this parable, the worst prison that you and I can be put in is in an unforgiving heart. Many of us have experienced this when we have refused to forgive someone. We end up subjecting ourselves to torment, frustration, and anxiety. It has been said that forgiveness is like air in our lungs. There's only room for you to inhale the next lungful when you've breathed out the previous one. If you insist on withholding forgiveness, Refusing compassion when needed, you will suffocate very quickly. In verse 35, Jesus emphasizes that his father's heart is one, one of forgiveness, and our hearts must be as well. When you and I embrace and extend forgiveness, we can receive God's love and forgiveness. And that brings us to our second main truth tonight. Following God's heart means offering extravagant forgiveness to others. Following God's heart means offering extravagant forgiveness to others. Jesus had two reasons for telling the story in these verses, to reveal the heart behind Peter's question and to reveal our hearts. In his groundbreaking 20-year study at a major medical center in Florida, Dr. Dick Tibbetts said, every one of us has a grievance story, a hurtful event perpetrated by someone who mattered in our lives. And for most of us, that hurt simply will not go away enter forgiveness. Unfortunately, while most of us have been taught that we should forgive, we've never really been shown how or why to forgive. The truth is forgiveness does not balance the scales of justice any more than vengeance does. But a failure or inability to forgive creates an inner anger, sometimes observable, but oftentimes unseen, that affects our emotional, spiritual, and physical well-being from broken relationships, and the cynicism can lead to isolation, health issues, 
And all of that can shorten our life expectancy. Forgiveness is the only way to get your life back and to keep your past from destroying your future. So from, the, from his work, Forgive to Live, there's 10 principles to make forgiveness a way of life. First, accept the facts. Life is not fair. You are not alone. Everyone has a story. Remember, others may play by a different set of rules. Stop blaming others. My life is not your fault. You are not a victim. They are not a villain. Your version of the story may not be completely accurate. I have a carefully crafted and practiced story. Unfortunately, I may not have all of the facts. You cannot change the past, it's impossible. And I cannot change the event and I cannot change the other person. Acknowledge the anger and pain. Denial only delays the process. Anger is an emotion that is a warning sign. Pain is an indicator of a wound that needs healing. Evaluate the impact it has on you. The facts don't lie. I will know physically, psychologically, socially, and spiritually. Separate the myths from the facts. There is a difference. Forgive and forget. Forgiveness implies it's okay. Forgiveness means we make up. Forgiveness lets them off the hook. Forgiveness is a choice I make, not a mystical experience. Forgiveness is giving up my right to hurt you and leaving it up to God to settle the score. I have the ability to act. Remember, stimulus, reflect, respond. Follow the example we're given. It is powerful and easy to understand. And the old question, what did Jesus do? Do what Jesus did. Forgiveness is a journey and a skill we must learn over time. It takes time for healing to occur. The deeper the wound, the longer the healing time. And, and uh, Dr. Tippett said, Forgiveness is a way of learning how to handle life rather than being overwhelmed by it. The first person to benefit by forgiveness is the one doing the forgiveness. Jesus is telling us that forgiveness must be a way of life for his followers. As sinners, we frequently hurt each other, and that's why we all need to constantly exercise and receive forgiveness. If we call Jesus Lord, we must also follow his heart and follow in the footsteps of the one who prayed, Father, forgive them, as he hung dying on the cross at the hands of wicked men. So what stops you and me from either saying, I'm sorry, or saying, I will forgive you? All too often, it's likely because we're th thinking too highly of ourselves or we're feeling a bit more superior in some way. But either way, our attitudes reveal that we have forgotten or maybe never learned that the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who has been turned inside out and has childlike humility. God is not saying it's easy or natural to forgive, but he is saying that if you follow him, you must have a heart for forgiveness, his heart. Only Jesus can enable this kind of forgiving heart in us, and that must characterize our lives. So will you ask him to show you who in your life you should be receiving and asking uh, for forgiveness and offering forgiveness. So some reflection questions for this week. Have you experienced restoration in a relationship with another? How is God reminding you he restored your relationship with him? When have you drawn a line refusing to forgive someone in your life? Will you remember that God forgave you and offered you forgiveness? How is God encouraging you as you learn to trust him and his word? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the extravagant love that you've shown to all of us. Thank you for intentionally weaning us from the dependence on ourselves and purifying us of our idols. Father, we thank you for supplying what we lack and leading us into a greater faith and obedience. Father, personalizing this help me honor those the world fails to recognize and to put others before myself. Lord, help me to keep to not keep records of wrongs. That's what love requires of me. Help me to forgive freely, just as you have forgiven me countless times. And so I will reflect you every day to every person that you place in my path. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So have a great time of discussion this week, and we look forward to seeing you back again next week.